Good day students, welcome to MathCodeServe.com. In this clip we're going to be going over problems 1 to 5 of the January 2018 Algebra 1 New York Regents released exam. Alright, let's take a look at question 1. It reads, when solving the equation 12x squared minus 7x equals 6 minus 2 times the quantity x squared minus 1. Evan wrote 12x squared minus 7x equals 6 minus 2x squared plus 2 as his first step. Which property justifies this step? So we have um, four properties presented. Alright, so before we answer this question, let's review the properties real quick. Real quick review. Um, now, what is the subtraction property of equality? The subtraction property of equality is as follows. You have two numbers that are identical. So if A is equal to B, then if you subtract C from both sides of the equation, equality is preserved. Okay, so A minus C is A minus C is the same thing as what? B minus C. Okay, so this is the subtraction property of equality as applicable when you're solving an equation and you subtract the same number from both sides of the equation. The second property is multiplication property of equality. Uh, the same initial condition, if A is equal to B, then if you multiply both sides of the equation by the same number, so uh, if you multiply both sides of the equation by C, Guess what? Equation is preserved. Equality is preserved also. Okay. Associative property of multiplication just basically means that when you're grouping your products, it doesn't really matter the order in which you group them. So let's say you're multiplying three numbers A times B times C, and you associate A, I mean B C first, and then multiply by A, you get the same result if you multiply A B first and um, multiply the result by C, okay? So this is the same thing as A times B, associated with each other first, and then multiplied by C. The last one is just distributive property of multiplication over subtraction. So if you have a factor on the outside and a difference in the parentheses, what this property says is you can, if you have a multiplication here operation, you can distribute this number on the outside across these two values inside the parentheses. Okay? Uh, when you execute that procedure, you end up with A, B, minus, so A times B is A, B, minus A, C. Alright? So with these four properties in mind, let's take a look at which one is applicable to um, even solution. So he started with 12x squared minus 7x equals 6 minus 2 times x squared minus 1. And then he ended up with this um, result. Now what's the difference between what he started with and what he ended up with? If you examine it closely, you notice that the parenthesis that's here is no longer present. Okay. So which of the properties <coughs> that we have here has to do with parenthesis? The, the third and the fourth, right? But if you take a look at the third one, what you're doing is just reassociating your products, right? So you have a parenthesis on the left side and the parenthesis is still remains on the right. If you take a look at operation, the property number four, you see distribution happening. You have a parenthesis on the left and on the right the parenthesis is gone because the factor on the outside has been distributed across the difference. Now let's take a look at this situation right here. This 2 and this x squared minus 1, what property do you think will we will um, execute to arrive at this result? We're going to have to distribute negative 2, right? So negative 2 will be distributed to x squared and negative 1. Let's carry out that distribution. We're going to have 12x squared minus 7x equals 6 negative 2 times x, positive x squared is negative 2x squared and negative 2 times negative 1. Remember, whenever you're multiplying and the signs are the same, you end up with a positive plus 2. 
okay that's exactly what he has here the property that we just um, executed is known as a distributive property of multiplication because we're multiplying over subtraction because we have a difference of terms in the parentheses so the answer to question number one is option number four all right let's take a look at question two it reads Jill invests four hundred dollars in a savings bond the value of the bond V of X in hundreds of dollars after X years is illustrated in this table below question which equation and statement illustrate the approximate value of the bond in hundreds of dollars over time in years so we have four options here if you examine it closely you notice that the equations are identical pairs so one two are the same and then three four are the same but the difference between one and two and three and four is that one indicates growth and the other decay all right so something you want to remember just a vocabulary term that you probably already know is that growth indicates that your output is increasing okay increasing output and in this case your output is v of x okay because this is your input and this is your output and what does decay mean decay means that your output is decreasing okay something is losing value or amount decreasing output indicates decay okay now let's take a look at the output values and see what the behavior is 4 5.4 7.29 it's going up it's increasing okay since it's increasing that means that we have a growth scenario so this observation can help us to eliminate two options from our alternatives and those are the options that specify decay so we can take out two and take out four because we're looking at growth um, a growth scenario all right so to finish this off we'll just fire up our calculators we are going to make use of the table function to see which of these two functions generate this table that's provided here okay so for function one I'm going to put in the first one four parentheses 0.65 carats to exponentiate x enter and then the second one for parentheses 1.35 carat x enter okay so I'm not going to look at the graph I'm going to go to the table because I need the numerical representation of these two exponential functions okay so um, table is on the graph but button right there the blue option depending on what calculator you're using so if I go to the table and I just compare which one matches what I have here uh, we can clearly see that it's the second function y2 which is 4 times 1.35 raised to the x okay so our answer for question 2 is option number 3 all right let's take a look at question three it reads um, Alicia purchased H half gallons of ice cream for three dollars fifty cents each and P packages of ice cream cones for two dollars fifty cents each she purchased 14 items and spent forty three dollars which system of equations could be used to determine how many of each item Alicia purchased okay so uh, before we get started let's take a look at uh, a formula real quick concerning computation of um, total cost okay so to get the total cost of an item let's call that TC what you do is you multiply the unit cost by the quantity okay so keep that in mind we're generating a system of equations here so it's very good to label your equations before you start generating them so you can keep everything organized we have two sets of equations we're going to be looking at our cost equations and our quantity equations okay all right so let's start with the cost equations so cost equations 
Our costs are broken up into two parts. We're looking at the costs for um, ice cream and the cost for cones. So let's do ice cream first. So the cost for ice cream is going to be um, the unit cost which is $3.50 multiplied by the quantity. So let's, let's write that down. So for ice cream, the unit cost is um, $3.50 and the quantity is how many ice cream were there? Well, we don't know. So H uh, represents the quantity. All right, so that's for ice cream. And then we also have cones. So for the cones, the unit cost is what? The unit cost for cones is $2.50 and the quantity is given by P. Okay? Alright, so with this piece of information we can now generate our cost equation. So, cost equation ice cream first is going to be um, the unit cost times quantity which is 3.50 times the quantity H. Okay? And then we're going to add on the cost of the cones. Alrighty, so for cones, we're gonna have the unit cost, which is 250, multiplied by the quantity, which is P. So your total cost, cost of ice cream and cones together, um, is indicated by the amount spent, which is $43. So this is equal to 43. Alright, so there goes your cost equations. With that, we can eliminate options three and four. So it's either option one or two. The next one is known as your quantity equations. Okay, quantity equation. Actually, it's just one equation. Quantity equation. So for quantity equation, we're just going to be adding these two quantities. Okay, we're told that um, there are a total of 14 items purchased. Okay, so there are 14 items purchased. So your quantity equation is going to be the amount of ice cream cones you purchased, which is H, plus the uh, amount of um, cones you purchased, which is P, will give you the total amount of items purchased, which is 14. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Oh, we can even eliminate. So we have 0 0.3. 3.5H, so we can eliminate this one also. We don't have to do the second one. So 3.5H plus 2.5P equals 43, and H plus P equals 14. Answer to question three is option number one. All right, let's take a look at question four. It says um, a, re a relation is graphed on the set of axes below. So we see the relation right here as a graph of, of a parabola. So it's the question is based on this graph, the relation is. Um, is it a function or not? If it is or is not, what's the reason? So real quick um, review on what qualifies the graph of a relation to be a function is as follows. The graph of a relation is a function if what? If it passes the vertical line test, the VLT. Okay, sounds like a dish. Vertical line test. Alrighty. So, what is the vertical line test? This is a vertical line test. Let's I'll go over that again real quick. If I draw a vertical line and this vertical line intersects the graph at exactly one point in the entire domain, then that graph is the graph of a function. Okay? So it means to pass. To pass means not more than one intersection. If it intersects more than once at any point in the domain, then um, it fails the vertical line test, hence, the relation is not a function. In this case, how many points of intersection can you see between this vertical line test and the graph at any specified x value? At any point, the graph. Into the vertical line intersects the graph at exactly one point. 
okay so we have a point of intersection here right here so anywhere you go you have only one point of intersection that basically means that every input is assigned to exactly one output all right so this graph is the graph of a function because it passes the what the vertical line test so the answer to question number four is option um, two the relation is a function because it passes the vertical line test all right let's take a look at question five it says Ian is saving up to buy a new baseball glove every month he puts ten dollars into a jar which type of function best models the total amount of money in in the jar after a given number of months n so um, to help us determine what kind of function is represented by this scenario let's just generate some values okay so let's say um, call it X and Y so X represents the months Y represents the amount total amount of money in the jar so in the first month he has ten dollars in the second month he adds 10 so he has 20 in the third month he adds another 10 which gives us 30 okay so every month what is um, iron doing iron is adding 10 every month okay now if you divide the change in Y over the change in X what you're looking for is something called the average rate of change okay so this is one this is one what you notice is that the average rate of change is always the same 10 over 1 for the first scenario 10 over 1 for the second scenario if the average rate of change is always the same or your difference is always the same um, then guess what the relate the um, the graph or this or the situation is linear Okay, so let's go ahead and write that down. If the average rate of change of the table of a function is constant, okay, then the table is that of a linear function linear means you have a constant growth rate and that constant growth rate is known as a slope okay the slope is always the same for um, a straight line or a linear function all right so the answer to question number five is option one because the average rate of change is always constant now for exponential functions what you notice in that case is you have repeated multiplication that's how you identify exponential functions for quadratic that one is a little bit more involved you have to find the average rate of the average rate of change or the second difference if that's a constant they have a quadratic function for square root functions you can just examine the input and output patterns and see if the input is being square rooted to generate the output okay so in this case since we are adding the same constant over and over again we have a common difference then we know that um, the relation the, the function is a linear function as depicted in this scenario right here so our answer is option number five Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this presentation. Really appreciate it. If you found the contents of this tutorial helpful in your review for the upcoming Regents exam, do give us a thumbs up. We appreciate your positive feedback. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for updates to other tutorials such as this. If you have any questions or comments about any concepts covered in the um, New York Regents exam any math components just uh, post it in the comments section below okay so just post your questions or comments uh, below more great support resources can be found on mathgotserve.com go ahead and check it out thanks again for watching and have a wonderful day goodbye